As most of you know, the province of Ontario announced in November of 2010 a new initiative, the creation of the Ontario Brain Institute, or OBI as we call it, and also to help develop a neuroscience commercialization cluster as a primary means of improving delivery uh, of new findings as well as to create jobs. We've been in existence for a relatively short period of the time. In that time, we've helped to create and fund three province-wide programs, namely in epilepsy, cerebral palsy, and neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and attention deficit disorder. We have helped develop a neurotechnology cluster in Toronto by assisting institutions to bring in approximately $11 million in federal development funds matched by close to $13 million from industry partners. We embed science into care in a way that involves patients and their advocates and commercialization into research. OBI has achieved much of this, as Kathy has said, by catalyzing, integrating and connecting so that the whole is much greater than the parts. But even though we're young, we're looking to the future, and this is the reason for today's panel. We're looking for frank discussion from our panelists on what the future of neuroscience can and should be. And so we've come through, in the last hundred years, an astounding uh, period of time in neuroscience, where we have learned a lot about all the parts uh, of the nervous system, and about the different chemical system it's used, and about its variation and connections, and about a million different things. How do they interact? How do you acquire the total uh, function uh, to, if you're going to understand the brain? If, on the basis of the idea that the human brain has become a major part of the neuroscience agenda because we can actually study it now in many different ways and in ways that are produ producing incredibly useful new information. Neuroscience is a really young field. The first major meeting was, what, 1971 with 1,000 members. Now this year there's 35 or 40,000 grown you know, exponentially, but it's not a mature field like, for instance, physics, which has been around for 150 years, where theory drives experiments. What we're seeing in, in neuroscience is that's how we started, collect a lot of data and try to sort it out, and we're now in a phase where theory is beginning to heavily influence the kind of experiments you're done, and that's a great transition. Uh, so we came through the decade of the brain, right, a decade ago. Uh, and some change, and, and that led to a massive increase uh, in, in our knowledge and our understanding of some of the biochemistry, some of the functionality of the brain. Um, our ability to ask questions with regards to brain function, to localization, to processing, to higher cognitive abilities, to the ability to actually ask, do they still reside in a brain that we think is non-functional? And then to take that back into the cellular biology and understand what that means uh, has absolutely been breathtaking. And the problem is that we are not linking it together well. So what we have to do, I think, in uh, how we set up our systems of care is to work in teams that are both scientists as well as clinicians and social scientists and governments to do the best we can to deal with these really devastating disorders. I think our intrinsic nature as scientists is that we get up and we go into the lab in the morning, whether it's a cognitive lab or it's a clinic, and, and we're being innovative. We're asking the question about how do we build on the knowledge that, is, that has been laid down before us. That's fundamental innovation, and I think that's at the cell biology, that's at the mechanistic level. That scientists, uh, everybody says, oh, they're, they're really curious. That's probably not it. Uh, what's more likely is the scientifically inclined listens to somebody's explanation about something. And they say, eh, that's not how it works. No, 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 that's not it. And they go to work. As a scientist, I think your driving force is you want to figure something out. It kind of follows up on what Mike said. And that's your focus. When you, your PhD student, they say, what should I do? They say, well, pick something you want to figure out so that when you're all done, you, can, you know you've contributed a piece of new knowledge to the enterprise. I think sometimes innovation comes from um, looking at what everybody sees and seeing something different. I think that fashion uh, drives science as it does uh, what we wear and that sometimes it's having the courage to say, um, that's what everybody thinks, but I don't think it's that. Mark, I loved the fact that you used the word courage. 
I, I think it's utterly critical here. You see some people that have all the intellectual machinery to do this well. They've been everything. They've got all the right academic credentials. And it bothers them deeply when their experiment doesn't end up the way it, they thought it would. And for people that are in this business that really care about it and love it, it's the day that Mother Nature throws you that curveball. And then you have to have the courage to deal with it. There are many layers to it. There are the people who are just out there following their nose and discovering things. There's the person above it who's looking around for something to use to solve a problem they have. And then if something should work, there's another layer of people who come in and say, well, you know, that could really be use useful for the human condition. Uh, I think innovation is now a, a team sport, and it involves uh, all of these people. I don't think any scientist should be expected to do anything. I, I actually still believe in academic freedom. But in parallel with that, I don't think you should be criticized or shunned for being involved in things that might become commercialized. In the end, I think if what you're doing can benefit a human being, I think you're ethically responsible to actually pursue it, or at least to try to facilitate it. We need to understand that as we're moving forward and educating the next generation of scientists, that the probability that they're going to be in our academic milieus is, is less than what it was in the past, which means we need to be training a generation that does understand what the industry relationship is, what commercialization truly means, how research does drive towards an endpoint. I think we, we have to have room to have what all of us believe is just the nascent, what a great idea, I'm going to just drive at that, and I don't care whether I sell it, but we need to understand where it fits in the spectrum. So. I, mean, I think we have to have commercial possibilities to encourage people to take those risks. And I would say that OBI in some ways could facilitate our mutual understanding of the roles that we play. You have to um, create the opportunities, make it easier for people to do that, and also have a partnership that makes sense in terms of the skill sets of the commercial entities versus the academic scientists. Well, science is a uh, very expensive enterprise. Everybody knows that and that it's a different enterprise than a strictly business enterprise. If I give an engineer in this room a million dollars and I say, I want you to build a toaster for me, there's no question that at the end of the time there will be a toaster. If you give uh, the uh, ALS researcher a million dollars and say, we sure like to have a cure of this by the end of this million dollars, there's no chance in hell. Part of scientific and public education is to point out that, you know, we're not building toasters. I want to thank all of you for being here, but I particularly want to thank our, our phenomenal panel for uh, their insights and their expertise and their time. Thank you.